don't know if you've ever thought about it, but Jesus' primary examples or I images, things that he brought up were relating to fishing. I mean, he even got fishermen, right? But, but fishermen in that day were not, they did not use a little pole like we think of fishing today, right? They used nets. You ever think about that? Well, nets involve lots, right? Not just a few. It's not poles, right? Poles are one at a time. Now, the truth is, like I wrote here, Jesus demonstrated net fishing and not just pole fishing. Both forms of communicating the gospel have relevance and importance, right? Okay? We're not pitting one form of, of reaching the world with another. There's no need to do that. But, but there is a, there, I think there's a case to be made that, you know, the, the vision, the, the, the imagery that the disciples received was a net full of fish. And they're just like, what happened here? You know, we couldn't catch any. And all of a sudden we're catching a bunch, right? So, so that's really important. The Christian gospel carries with it a power to captivate entire cultures and nations. When it's not, we must begin an informed effort to ascertain why, right? It's just not okay, okay? You have to realize that. You, you cannot be okay with the idea that the Christian gospel doesn't, um, doesn't captivate an entire nation or an entire world. You can't be okay with it. No way around it. Uh, if you do, then your meaning that you're finding in the Christian gospel is, is something that you should really think about. Okay, because that's, that's a little bit of, um, of what cultural apologetics is bringing in, is that, you know, the meanings matter a lot. And so let's keep going. Medievals, we're talking about the Middle Ages, okay? And a um, thousand years of Christian history. They have been falsely maligned. I do want to bring this up. Stephen, these are secular historians, right? Stephen J. Gold, there never was a period of flat earth darkness among scholars. Regardless of how the public at large may have conceptualized our planet both now and then, Greek knowledge of sphericity never faded, and all major medieval scholars accepted the Earth's roundness as an established fact of cosmology. Even historians point out there's scarcely a Christian scholar in the Middle Ages who did not acknowledge Earth's sphericity and even know its approximate circumference. Okay? I bring this up because one of the first things you hear is it was the Dark Ages, right? Not only the Dark Ages, oh yeah, people believed the Earth was flat. Okay, and the idea here is that it was the Christian interesting era, which for secular people was the uninteresting era. Okay, but so what, what do you end up with? You know, light and darkness. You end up with a lot of false thoughts out there. And my encouragement relating to, to, to the medieval ages is anything you've heard, you should question it. Okay, and I'm just giving you a, a one to give you an example. Okay, they thought the earth was flat. No, they didn't think the earth was flat. Okay, not only that, um, the Middle Ages were scholarly, mature, and not at all dark, right? This was, the, um, this was the age of Thomas Aquinas, okay? He's still referred to today as Thomas because he set the highest standards of scholasticism. Our university structures and thinking are all based on Thomas Aquinas, who is just a, basically a, um, a, a product of the Middle Ages, of the Medieval Ages, right? So we also see the birth of science, and Dr. Nancy Piercy has a book on this if you're into, into that kind of thing. But she points out that the, the, the only way modern science could develop was through the Christian faith and particularly through medieval faith. It was also the period of the creation of all the universities. Okay? This is a very uh, mature and scholarly era. And the, everything you hear about it, reverse, is only, again, it's only because... To, if you were secular, you have very, in, very little interest. It was called the Middle Ages because before it was the Roman Empire and after it was the Enlightenment. Those were both considered ages of the Gentiles, you could say. In between was the Dark Ages, okay? They weren't dark at all. They weren't, um, they weren't like I just mentioned about the, about the earth. The more you study the, the Middle Ages, um, and C.S. Lewis was a medievalist, if you're wondering, which means a medieval hist historian. But the more you study about the Middle Ages, you find out, wow, why was this kept from me? Okay. And there's a reason. Okay. Why? Because, you know, the world just has a way of diminishing the very things that are important. Okay. So I want to encourage you to think about it differently. Um, one of the things Thomas Aquinas brought up that I think is really important that for you to know, if you ever hear an argument counter to your faith, um, you should always set up the very best the opposition has to offer. Okay. Um, Thomas Aquinas set that standard in the, and the medievals were known for this. Okay, so the idea here is that you not only have nothing to fear, the medievals had nothing to fear. If you want to find an argument against your faith, come up with the very best of it. Don't stop halfway. Help other people. 
right? Oh, you're saying this. You mean this, this, and this, and this. You, know, you, you need to flush it out to the very best as you can. This is something the medievals um, have to offer us, is to remember, hey, you know what? If you properly understand your faith and the meaning of your faith, you have nothing to fear, and you, should, you want to set up the very best, okay? Because it's, it's, it's better to watch a giant fall than to watch a little thimble fall. Okay, so that's the point that Thomas Aquinas threw out there. Okay, um, the medievals took reason seriously, right? Now, I'm not going to spend time on this. This is just to give you a background. And some ontological proof of God's existence. Have you all ever heard of that? Okay, I'm not going to get into it because we don't have time, but I did want to bring this up. He basically says that you can prove that God must be without doing anything but, but, but agreeing that God exists as an idea in the mind. And... And uh, you can argue through, which I don't want to do right now because of time, but you can argue through that God must exist. And this argument may sound a little porous to you, like weak or something, but it stands strong and is considered one of the strongest arguments today for the existence of God. And it's, it's from the medieval mind, and it's based on nothing but, the, but, but your mind and the idea that God could exist. And he could prove God exists simply from the idea that God could exist. Okay, so this is in the slides, and if you're the kind of sort that really enjoys this, you should engage. I don't want to do it because you, you've got so many mental cycles, and I don't, want to, I don't want to stick you on it right now. Okay, let's keep going. The culture of medieval, Middle Ages, I'm going to use those terms in, interchangeably. Okay, the, the culture of medieval Middle Ages uh, informs today's cultural challenges. Okay, that's what we're really interested in. By the way, if you're wondering, next week's spring break, the final two weeks is what we've been kind of building all up to. Okay. So, so you don't want to miss it, but this really sets things up. You want to understand medieval ages and, and the, the ideas that we don't think about anymore, but we should. Okay. So I'm going to keep going. I'm going to start by going back a little bit to the, to, to the idea of effective alternative cultures. They clarify their opposition. They regularly withdraw. And they methodically engage. Okay. This is important to, um, to understand and I would say that most of the time, when you look at the reason that Christians have so much trouble with making progress today in history, that is, is lack, of, lack of understanding who their opposition is, and, um, and then everything just flows from there. Okay? But I bring this up because, and I'm going to do this very quickly, but um, how are you excluded or mistreated by the public? Like you could use an example, I'm going to use an example, okay? Uh, hookup culture, okay? Um, you know, how, how, is, how is your values excluded or mistreated when it comes to a cup culture? You can answer that question, and um, you can think, well, you know, maybe my ideas of, um, of uh, biblical values are uh, mocked or something, right? They're mistreated, or they're diminished, or they're thought of as prude or, or un, uh, untenable, not realistic, right? Um, are they, how are they distinct? Right? What distinguishes your culture from the public culture, way of life? Is it, is it the meaning? You know, is it, a, is it a mixture of those things? Is it legitimate? Are the distinctions recognized, right? Would the, would the culture at large recognize that your views on hookup culture are legitimate? Okay. I'm, I'm just doing a quick review here, and I'm going to bring up why in a minute. Okay. But uh, would, would, the, would the public think your views on um, hookup culture are legitimate? And um, is, is hookup culture something you want to spend your time communicating? Right? You know, you might, you might have disagreements, but you may not care about it. I don't know. Okay? Now, let's keep going. I want to give you one other thought here, and then I'll explain why. And what voice do you choose to respond? Right? You could choose a prophetic voice, or a pastoral voice, or a persuasive voice. And we've discussed how, really, in our culture today, a persuasive voice is something that we don't recognize, but we need to, and it's going to make a big difference. Okay? And I'm going to keep going here very quickly, a review. Once you understand the voice, like in hookup culture, are you trying to be prophetic, like use the Bible to tell people you're wrong? The problem with that might be a problem of meaning, right? If the Bible isn't meaningful to them, it just sounds like you're just trying to force them to do something they don't want to do, right? So in what voice do you choose to respond? Persuasive it makes a lot of sense right now. Um, truth, right? Are the false, what are the false beliefs we hold about the public, right? Well, do you, uh, do you may believe that people in hookup culture, well, they don't care about anything meaningful or, you know, um, all they care about is pleasure or, you know, there's all these things that you could come up with that may actually be incorrect and not truthful about people who live out hookup culture, right? And so knowing that is going to help you 
And so let's use their commonality, right? Here's another question. What do we share in common with people with, in hookup culture? Okay, do we? Right? And the truth is there's actually a lot in common, okay? But uh, I bring up this, these questions here for a reason, okay? And um, who are we? What are our values regarding culture, regular recalibration, right? Okay, so I used hookup culture just to kind of go through this real quickly. And the reason was to point out, you know, a lot of times our problems are we don't know how to answer these questions. Like, for example, what do we share in common with the public? Okay, well, you know, you probably have to think about it a lot. Now, if you, if you just walked in, I did want to say I'd love to have some discussion times with everybody. I'll be glad to, like, treat with a pizza party or whatever if we, you know, can get together once a month or whatever if you have interest, okay? But um, then... You have to go through, and again, I'm just going to select a co cooperation. What areas do you work with the culture? Here's one, meaning making. How do we communicate meaning, the meaning of our blessing in the pu public vernacular? Okay, this is probably the biggest question that hopefully that's on your mind. You know, what in the heck does that mean even? Okay, you know, some of you have already submitted that as a question right there, right? Or here's another one that's interesting, right? In what ways do we choose to bless the public? In what, and how are we involved in the affairs of the world and the lives of the people we serve, okay? Now, these questions are, are incredibly engaging and difficult to answer, but they're important as heck. They're the questions that, that oftentimes get us in trouble. We don't know the answers to these, okay? Now, I bring these up just to say, and by the way, finish with persevering, right? I bring these up to say, when you look at middle, middle, the medieval ages, you're answering these questions, okay? Or at least you're getting the basis for forming an understanding of how to answer them, okay? So I wanted to remind you that there's actually a, a uh, process by which an alternative culture engages, but in that process, the most important parts are parts that we usually struggle so much with that it's like, you know, we just you know, either give up or, or our answers just aren't successful. Like they're not useful to the culture, okay? So that's why you need to know the process, but even more important is how to answer some of these questions, okay? So that's what we're doing by looking at ancient culture, which we did last week. I'm gonna remake those slides because, you know, there's echo and everything. And then this week we're looking at medieval. Next week we're gonna, or two weeks from now, we're gonna do the modern, and we're gonna be answering these questions, okay? And looking at detail, or at least looking at the background, so that when you try to answer them, you have a informed <laughs> answers that really make a difference versus your own opinion, which, you know, I'm not saying it's bad, but, you know, you probably want more than that, okay? Uh, sorry about that, okay. Okay, so let's keep going. So that's what we're focusing on. And meaningful characteristics, we talked about this last week again, just doing a quick review. These are characteristics that are meaningful. Freedom is a meaningful characteristic. Some people, some professors, actually many professors, would say that the the most meaningful characteristic to 20, 2024 America is freedom, okay? And the idea here is that people value freedom more than they value anything else. Like this is we're dying for, you could say. And then individual dignity and dualism, you know, in America today, we value the idea that, um, that what you believe you should be able to express, and you should be able to express it, and to be able to, to stop the ability for you to express what you believe or who you are is, the, is maybe one of the greatest crimes you could commit on mankind, okay? That's not totally wrong, but we also studied last week how there's the law of uh, mean, the golden mean, where anything, freedom or dignity, all these things can be taken too far. And so we, we talked about that last week. I'm not gonna review that, but I will get the, the uh, you know, the PowerPoint back together, and tribalism and collective character, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay, yeah. You know, and, and yeah, I'm glad you noticed that, right? Put them together there. Um, we talked about it a little last week, um, but basically the idea is that in our individual dignity, um, it's coming from a, from a uh, and freedom, really, all these kind of work together, but, and we're going to talk about this a lot in the last two weeks, which is modern culture. Okay. But the idea here is that, um, is that America values the idea of individual dignity, but it wants that dignity be, to be separate, the dignity to be separate from science, which it also values. Okay? So it's almost like you have, the, you have evolution and biology, which is all about facts, and then you mix in, I don't want facts when it comes to dignity. I want the two to be smashed together. Right? And that's what you're living in. And if, if it's... If, I'll just share this as an advance, but that's, that's something that's happened as a result of a, of a progression through history 
it's not something just randomly occurred, okay? This idea that we want to have, we want to have our, our, our biology and we want to have our, you know, whatever we feel at the same time, that didn't happen by accident, okay? That's something that's, there's a history of how this has happened and that's what you're living out today. When you understand the history of it, you start understanding with insight how you undo it. Because when you undo it, you're freeing people up and you're blessing them because no one actually wants this. People are trapped by each of these. Like too much freedom is a trap, right? It's not the golden mean, which we talked about last week. Too much dignity or opposing it with dualism is a trap. And so the, very, the devil, you can see a little bit, the devil traps people by using these different mechanisms or these different, these different values, okay? And we're gonna focus on freedom and individual dignity a little bit more this week. Okay. And I apologize, I just have a ton of material to go to, so I so badly want to interact about your questions because they're so good, but I also know how much we need to talk about. So, okay. so is that okay if we keep going for now? Is that okay? Good. Okay. Collective character is the idea that you, there are some things that everyone has to believe. Okay. And if you don't believe them together, there's a problem. Okay. Let's keep going. Two, last week we talked about um, eudaimonia. And the concept of eudaimonia, how important that is to culture. The idea is that the goal of every person is happiness. Okay? And what's interesting is the question, how then does one live happily? How does one live happily? And um, there's, an art, there's a, um, a paper, uh, it's actually a little a booklet. You can, you can read this. It's called Leisure, the Basis of Culture. I recommend it. Um, oh, let me go back. Um, Leisure, the Basis of Culture. I recommend it because it is, um, it's like a must read by anybody in high society. Okay. So like if you're a doctor or, you know, if you're like a billionaire or whatever, you've probably been accustomed to reading this, this, art, this uh, pamphlet called Leisure, the Basis of Culture. And the idea behind it, I should tell you, is it began with the mid ages, with the medieval times, okay? And the idea is that um, um, in, in the medieval times, they, they split out the liberal arts from practical skills, okay? Yeah, and li the word liberal arts actually originated in ancient history, but it was really Thomas Aquinas and others really perfected the idea of liberal arts. And you might wonder, why do these things even exist? Why do we have liberal arts? Have you ever wondered that? I know I did in, when I was in college. Okay. But the idea, and there's a lot to it I can't get into. Man, I can't tell you how much I'd love to. But um, the idea is that societies that don't have liberal arts are not happy. Okay. And the reason is... Because here's the question, okay, you have to answer. Let's say, okay, I'm an engineer by, by trade, okay? If I work, I'm working for, to make money. Why am I making money? Well, so I can take care of my kids. Why do you have kids? You know, ultimately everything comes back to be happy, right? But then the question comes up, and that was from last week, okay? But the question comes up, okay, is, well, okay, I'm doing all this to be happy, then how do I be happy? How do I live happy, right? You know, do I just go back to my work? And just say, you know, I'm happy. And so this was a big question for people in the mid-ages. How do I live a happy life? Because I get eudaimonia. The, you know, eudaimonia was Aristotle. And the Middle Ages was based on Plato and Aristotle, which we talked a little last week. Okay? But so the idea here was that the, the thought is, is that what you, what you do as in practical skills like engineering or being a doctor or a lawyer, you do that so that you can live happily, and living happily involves the liberal arts, okay? In other words, you go to a ballet, okay? That's how you live happily. Or you write poetry, or you read poetry. You know, in other words, okay, I hope I'm making sense here. The idea was that life was not about work. Life was about leisure, okay? Today's meaning of leisure is just sitting around doing nothing. Okay? But that's not actually the correct meaning of leisure. Leisure was what you do in your spare time or what you do when you're not working. But by, by the way, if you just read the latest um, statistics on Norway, it's once again the happiest country in the world. Okay? And they've done studies and um, the question was, why are Norwegians so happy? Right? You, know, you know what's interesting? What Norwegians say is the reason they're happy? They say, we know what to do with our free time. That's what they say. It's interesting, you know, but it goes back to leisure, the basis of culture. In other words, cultures that work and work and work and have no vision for anything outside of work are, go are not going to succeed because 
you can't work and work and actually have a successful society or culture, okay? People don't necessarily understand that, but that's actually true, and it's been proven throughout history. That's why, legal, that's why liberal arts are taught in schools, okay? But it's also very important to the Middle Ages because they were answering this question, okay? Are y'all following me so far? Is that, am I giving enough background? Please raise your hand if I, you know, in many words, you know, I could, I could mess up. But so leisure is the basis of culture, and it's the basis of eudaimonia, and the idea is that you're not born to work. You're born to do something with your time. You do have to work, but you're born to do something with your time. But what is it? And if you can't answer it, you're in trouble, right? So our culture has a problem with this. We have no idea what to do other than work, right? So a lot of dads get accused of being workaholics. A lot of kids are upset because their, their dads, all they do is work or whatever. You know, he was such a good role model, but he wasn't there for me. I had a baseball game and he wasn't there or whatever else. We hear all this, okay? So leisure, the basis of culture, really important idea okay and that gets into sacramentalism and order from chaos okay these are two ideas that are the you might say the basis of medieval culture and we're going to focus first okay on sacramentalism we rightly associate sacramentalism with church and rightly so baptism is a sacrament for example as is communion these are special rituals in god in which god's grace is present in a particular way effecting a real transformation on those participating in it but sacramentalism had a much broader and deeper meaning in the mind of the middle ages okay this is really important people of those days took all things that existed even time as in some sense sacramental that is, they believed that God was present everywhere and revealed himself to us through people, places, and things through which his power flowed. Okay? Now, Protestantism, Catholicism, you know, they went separate ways. You could say in some ways, Protestants threw the baby out with the bathwater. Okay? It wasn't like all, all, everything that Catholics believed needed to be tossed out the window. Okay? Not at all. But it was an overreaction, you could call it. You know, it's like, Anything that could cause trouble or anything that's caused trouble, we're going to throw it all out, okay? And this was one of the concepts that got thrown out. And you could argue that it was a good reason for it. And I'm not trying to make a case for you to return to the Middle Ages, okay? Nothing like that, okay? This is insightful, okay? You're getting insight from culture. But I mean, I, I, I think I've really enjoyed understanding um, what sacramentalism was all about. It can really richly enliven your faith, okay? Because sometimes you ask as a Christian, What's my life about? You know, I want to serve God. But what does that mean? You know, does it mean go on staff? And, you know, that's great. I mean, sure, it does mean partly a vocational ministry. But there's a lot of people that don't get to go on staff or don't get to participate in full-time ministry. What does it mean to serve God for them? Right, you know, and it gets hard to figure all this stuff out. Sacramentalism was an attempt by the middle eight, by the medievals to answer these questions. And again, it's a thousand years. So this is a very mature answer. And you really have to study it out and ask a lot of questions and dialogue, you know. So forgive me if I give you the wrong version, you know. I'm going to try here, okay. But so in the sacramental view, so what does this mean? Let's talk about this, okay. In a sacramental view, things provide satisfaction and purpose and meaning. So things, okay. Sacramentalism is all about everything around you, okay. Things. And we're going to talk about it in detail, but things provide satisfaction and purpose and meaning. Nearness through God's accessibility. Clarity in influence. Just exactly how does influence work or how does God's influence work. And comfort in orderliness. Okay? So sacramentalism is all about these kind of concepts. Now we're going to look at satisfaction of purpose and meaning first. Okay? In a sacramental view, things provide. I'm just going to read these things. Okay? Now we talked about Plato last week, but... Every object or thing exists as a means to relationship with one another. Let me just stop for a minute right there, okay? The idea here is that, is that you and I can only relate as a result of something that's not you and that's not me, okay? If there was nothing that was not you and not me, you could not separate who's you from who's me, okay? There has to be something that's not you and not me, and that's an intermediate. And that intermediate is what we call a thing. Okay? So in other words, you live in a world of things, but these things are, are lanes, are avenues to, to connect. They're connectors for people. 
Okay, and that's actually what the what the medievals understood. Um, things are a means to relationship with one another. People often talk as if nothing were easier than for two naked minds to meet or become aware of each other. But I see no possibility of their doing so except in common medium which forms their external world. If your thoughts and passions are directly present to me like my own without any mark of externality or otherness, how should I distinguish them from mine? And what thoughts or passions could we begin to have without objects to think and feel about? Okay. Yes, Eliana. Okay, what, what, what this particular thought here is, is that everything exists for the purpose of connecting people to each other. Okay, yes. Everything exists for the purpose of connecting people to each other. Okay, you know, that's something else, although that, we're going to talk about that. That is important. What this is, is this idea that, for example, this right here, okay, you know, I put this object here, I just picked it up out of my living room, actually, it's my dad's, I picked it up for a reason, but, um, but you know, now, what this does is it forces you, it, this, this is a medium through which you and I can relate, you know, hey, why is that important to you, Jatine? You know, and I can tell you and you get to know a little bit about me. You know, um, I can, you can learn about my passions and desires by the things that I enjoy. And but if there was no thing in the world, if there's only you and I existing, you could not know me and I could not know you. OK, see, so things are bridges. And that's why this is the medievals understood things exist. Now, you, what you mentioned is is good. And that's we're going to get to that. OK, but this is just the idea that things are a bridge or a relationship between people. Yes. What you mentioned is good. And that's we're going to get to that. But this is just the idea that things are a bridge or a relationship. between That's right. Anything you see, anything not you, anything that's not a person. That's right. Well, his point is, is that you have to have something that's not spiritual in order for two spiritual beings to be able to interact. <clears throat> right. So and this is we, we talked about Plato last week, which is a little bit of the basis. You know, the idea was the, the the idea of the triad, you know, for two things to relate, there must be an intermediate. And so basically the medieval world was you could call it um, Platonic and Aristotelian. You know, they 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 thrived on Plato. And so this idea was really important, but it's not, it's not without its merit. In other words, this is a very true idea. And it's something really important because otherwise, and I'm, we're going to talk about a lot of things relating to things, okay? But uh, it, because what happens in, in what we call today is called nominalism, okay? Nominalism is there's no value on anything other than what you put into it, okay? So a chair is valuable to you if you sit on it. It's junk if you don't sit on it. Okay. See, there's no other. There's no other understanding of a thing. Yes. So a chair is valuable to you if you sit on it. It's junk if you don't sit on it. Okay. See, there's no other. There's no other understanding of a thing. Yes. Yeah. Like, did that follow some of that? Because like, yeah. Like even like, did we guide the culture into nominalism? Uh, yeah. You know, and that's a good question. I would say that um, you know, the, even uh, there's there is a there. Basically, the problem with things is once you really understand the value of a thing, then you're tempted to worship that thing, right? You know, and so that was the problem, right? Is that it, it introduces a potential for idolatry, okay? But the, here's the truth, though, is if you take away the potential for idolatry, you've also taken away the, the meaning of the thing. See, the idea is that only in Jesus can you understand the, the world that God has created. You can understand the meaning of the thing and learn to avoid the idolatry, right? But Protestantism said, no, no way, to, no thank you. Let's just get rid of it. The thing is in the way. Okay? And the reason partly was because these kinds of understand, this idea, this medieval understanding, we're going to, what we'll finish with is the death of medievalism. Okay. Medievalism died, and so a lot of these ideas that were true for a thousand years were all of a sudden just all thrown away at one time, whether they had merit or not. Okay. Well, a lot of these actually had a lot of merit and a lot to say about today. 
Okay. So because our, our, our basically people today, they don't know how to value things. When they see you and your ability to value things in a certain way, that is a blessing and a richness that makes you a positive alternative, right? Your view on things can be greater than the world's view on things, you know, but the only one we know is that we all have the thing in common. It's valueless. Who cares? Okay, right? So the thought here in the Platonic model, everything exists is related to every other thing that exists. They share a relationship to God, right? So God created them all, and he called them all good, okay? Everything he made, God called good, right? So truth is guaranteed. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip this just for the sake of time, but um, let me keep going. Um, in the medieval consensus, um, men construed reality in a way that empowered them to harmonize everything conceptually and find meaning amid the chaos, okay? So the idea here is that, um, is that once you understand that things exist for a reason and they're to connect people, that's also, by the way, similar to the idea of if you're trying to explain something that's a super, um, you know, um, um, <laughs> tell me the, the term, um, um, you know, something, a super sensible, right? If you're trying to explain a super sensible, you have to use something of this world to explain it, right? It's kind of a similar idea that there's, that things are a connector, okay? And I'm going to keep going just for the, the implication here is we enjoy the order of our world and the universe rather than working endlessly to provide our own structure and order in life, okay? So in other words, when we understand that things exist for a reason, we understand that everything has a purpose and meaning, and it's not up to, up to us to create meaning. We're to discover it, okay? And so this thought right here is a lot of times, I'll give you an example, like a, and my, my kids um, help correct me, I should use the word transgender, okay? You know, so I apologize about that. But, but, you know, in transgender, you have people, including you yourself, okay, you might be thinking this, how do I make value or meaning out of my life? Okay. Well, in medieval ages, you value and meaning surrounded you all the time. You could relax a little bit. Okay. But in today's world, there's no relaxing. There's no letting up. It's just emptiness followed by emptiness followed by emptiness. And you've got to somehow fill that void by yourself. Okay. It's a, it's a, it's a gutting feeling for most people trying to make sense of the world that they have to live through. And especially so the older you get, okay? Because when you're younger, you can just go, you know, travel or find a bunch of fun experiences, okay? But so um, everything is meaning and purpose. Medieval man didn't see him as fundamentally separate from the natural order. Rather, the alienation he felt was an effect of the fall. Okay, in other words, if I don't understand fully the, the, the idea of things, it's because I'm fallen. And there's so much more here that I don't understand, right? It, he, it made him difficult for humans to see creation as it really is. His task was to join himself to the love of God and harmonize his steps or the great cosmic dance. We'll talk about this great cosmic dance next in a minute. Okay. So in, in a sacramental view, uh, things provide nearness through God's accessibility. Okay, let me keep going here. I understand I'm introducing a ton of concepts here, but, you know, like I said, we can discuss them. I want to. Okay. Access, okay. So things provide accessibility to God. Things are present in our daily lives as a presence of the divine. Okay. See, when things are not valuable, valueless, then you realize that God has left you here with everything you need to be able to relate to one another. Things become valuable and they remind you of God's presence. Also, God is the one who made it. Okay, that's valuable. God made the thing. Now, he didn't directly make the chair, right? But he made a world of things, and he, has a, he calls them good. For God to call something good is important. As it has been for most people, Christian and otherwise, throughout history, religion was everywhere, and this is crucial. As a matter not merely of belief, but of experience. In the mind of medieval Christendom, the spirit world and the material world penetrated each other, and the division between them was thin and porous. Okay, thin and porous. Those are two words that you want to remember. They're, the veil between us and God was thin. And so you would see things like, you know, an incredible value on a funeral or on the bones of somebody, right? You know, and the idea there, it, you know, I mean, you could say it was superstition or you could say maybe they understood much more of the value of bones and we just throw it all out, right? You know, so, so you know, th there's, a, there's an in-between. But the point here is when you study the medievals, you understand a value on things that, hey, you know what? These things are all um, windows, you could say, 
windows into the presence of the divine. The power of sacred places and the relics of the saints had such potency to medievals. Okay, I'm not saying you should, you should go worship bones or anything, okay? Because God wasn't present in a vague spiritual sense, like a butler watching silently over a manor house. He was there, writes Taylor, as an immediate reality, like stones, rivers, and mountains. The specific sense in which he was present was a mystery and a source of speculation and contention even back then. But that he was truly present was not disputed. Okay, in other words, God was present in the things. Okay, maybe in a different way that he's present in you. But God was present. You know, I've got, like right now, I've got the um, ashes of my dad, you know, and, um, and we're about to do some special things with them. But, you know, is that really just symbolic? Right? You know, you have to answer that, right? Um, I have to answer that. And, and again, I'm not trying to say there's some kind of weird, you know, weird idolatry or anything, but I treat the ashes of my dad in a special way, right? And is that just in my mind or is that reality? Okay. The medievals would say that's reality. You know, the ashes of my dad are special. They're not just a bunch of atoms of matter collected together that you just assign a, a meaning to. There's actually some importance there that's real. Okay. Now, I'm, I bring this up because the culture that surrounds you doesn't think this way. But when you think this way, most people in most cultures do think this way. In other words, they want, they want to understand how to think more, more in ways that makes their lives richer. Okay? You're already familiar, familiar with this with your faith in general. Okay? This is an extension. Platonic medieval man held that reality was real. It was outside himself and dwelling in the darkness of the fall. He could perceive it, but not, could not, he could relate to it intellectually through faith and reason and know it through conversion of the heart. But the entire universe was woven into God's being in ways that are difficult for modern people, even believing Christians, to grasp. Okay? I, can't get, I can't get into it because I've got so much other stuff to share. But we can discuss it. Okay? Um, Christians in the Middle Ages took Paul's words recorded in Acts, in him we live and move and have our being. And in his letter to Colossians, he's before all things, and in him all things hold together in a much more literal sense than we do. Okay? Now, this has been so good for me. I think of Jesus as the blueprint of the universe. And so, in, like, I'll give you an example for me, how I live this out. You know, when I think of theology, I don't think of things written down. You know, when God wanted to give us theology, his word was Jesus. Right? That's what it says. And so when I think of it, I think of God's word as three-dimensional person. You can't put God's word simply on paper. Now, obviously, what's on paper is God's word. Okay? You know, but it's, in, it's God's word as it represents God's word, who is Jesus. Right? You know, but the idea here is, is that, um, is that there's, there is meaning to me when I think about the blueprint of the universe is a person. The blueprint of the universe is not a bunch of physics and laws. Right. What that tells me is that things like relationship and relating and all these concepts, they're as real as the chair in front of me. Right. This is from the medievals. Right. So and this works very well with Christian under Christian doctrine and Christian faith. Right. What we're saying is the blueprint of the universe is relational as well as physical and all this other stuff. It's the blueprint is not just a bunch of laws and physics. That's just a very that's a very small part of it. Just like you could say the, the Bible it, it catches something, but Jesus is the word of God, right? So, so let's keep going. The implication and the blessing for others, we can redirect the world's love and desire for objects into the love of the creator. Listen to Lewis. This is so good, okay? okay. The books or the music in which we thought the beauty was located will betray us if we trust, if we trust them. It, if, if, we, if we trust to them, it was not in them. It only came through them. Okay, you ever thought about it? Anything you love, anything you desire, okay? We thought the beauty was in the, in the object itself, okay? But, it only, but actually the beauty only came through those things that we desire. What came through them was longing. These things, the beauty, the memory of our own past, are good images of what we really desire. But if they're mistaken for the thing itself, they turn into dumb idols, breaking the hearts of their worshipers. For they are not the thing itself. They are only the scent of a flower we have found, the echo of a tune we have not heard, news from a country we have never yet visited. Do you think I'm trying to weave a spell? 
Perhaps I am, but remember your fairy tales. Spells are used for breaking enchantments as well as for inducing them. And, and you and I need, have need of the strongest spell that can be found to wake us from the evil enchantment of worldliness which has been laid upon us for nearly a hundred years. Now it's even more. Almost our whole education has been directed to silencing the shy, persistent inner voice. Almost all modern philosophies have been devised to convince us that the good of man is to be found on this earth. And yet it is a remarkable thing that such philosophies of progress or creative evolution themselves bear, bear reluctant witness to the truth that our real goal is elsewhere. When they want to convince you that the earth is your home, notice how they set about it. They begin by trying to persuade you that the earth can be made into heaven. Okay, did you catch that? The idea here is that um, if you're fooled, you'll think that the things you desire are things of this earth. But the minute you get anything of this earth, you realize that it wasn't the thing itself and it disappoints. But only you as Christians know what all these things that people desire are pointing to, right? Only you know that. That's a, that's a secret. We can direct the world's love for objects into the love of the creator, the satisfaction of their desire. Okay, do you get that? This is so important of a concept, and I'm giving it to you in such a short time. But the idea from the medievals was, what they understood was that the love of God was their desire. And they could, they could map it out through objects. They could map it out. Instead of being stuck thinking the desire was the object itself. This goes into people. I just lost my dad, right? I loved my dad, but the truth was he was not the, uh, the ultimate object of my desire, right? He was not the ultimate. He was pointing the way. He was pointing the way. And, you know, and it's not like I'm going to lose the love of my dad for him to point that way. You could, in one sense, you could say he had to go, right? And that's actually a, an interesting the theology we could go through. But he had to go because everything is going to continue to point to the love of the Creator, Okay, so let's keep going because I got more to go through. But okay, so clarity and influence. Let's keep going. Are we okay on time? Can I keep going? What time is it? Okay, good. We're doing all right. Okay. In the sacrament of you, things provide. Okay. Now, by the way, this is uh, Chigi's tomb. Okay. And what you'll see here is all the planets in a circle. Okay. The planets are in a circle, and then they're surrounded by men who do their bidding. Okay. And the the idea here, I'll just I'll just explain. Um, Lewis summarizes that the medievals were prone to thinking that cosmic forces controlled them more than the other way around. The cosmos actively influenced our world. The heavens bring us light and heat. Okay, think about this. The heavens bring you light and heat. They do influence your world. Okay, right? Uh, the sun is responsible for the seasons. Hey, they do influence your world. Tides are from the moon. Hey, that changes all kinds of things about you. The amount of sunlight exposure affects your mood. Cosmic radiation provides unknown benefits and hazards. These are just a few, okay? But the point here is that the, the medievals believed that you were not, you were not the master of your destiny. Okay? They believed that things outside of you were really the main influencers on your life. Okay. Now I bring this up, and I bring up some of this some of this cosmic stuff because the thought here is that do we really understand the universe and its impact and its role, even nature, its impact and its role? Studies come out all the time of the latest findings of eating an orange and how it changes you, right? You know, and the point here is that in modern thinking, you and I tend to think that we are in control of our destiny. Okay? And that leads to a whole set of thinking about how to live and a whole, you could say, a whole set of curses about how to live. But the medievals recognized that there was more to their lives than that they were in charge of their lives. Okay? And that changes a lot of things. Here's an example of the implication. The cosmos isn't just a scientific puzzle to be solved. The universe is much more than a cosmic riddle of origins. Okay? We tend to think that's all it is that surrounds us. It's a source of divine influence. Self isn't the primary influence on our lives. There are many forces at work in our lives, and most of them originate outside of ourselves. Okay? Now, here's the key. We become our best version when we're free from the idea that it was our doing. Okay? And Lewis brings this up. I'm going to just share this. Okay? But the idea here is that when you don't have to think of your life 
is your doing and it's all about you and, and the influence that you make and everything's all about you, you, you. And it's all from the inside out. When you can broaden your understanding of the world like the medievals did, then it lets you become the best version of yourself. Okay, now this is an example of the way Lewis put it. Okay, this is from The Weight of Glory. I don't know if you've heard that book, The Weight of Glory from Lewis. Okay, I'm going to just read this and then I'll try to explain it to you. Okay. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. With that, a good deal of what I had been thinking all my life fell down like a house of cards. I suddenly remembered that no one can enter heaven except as a child, and nothing is so obvious in a child, not in a conceited child, but in a good child, as its great and undisguised pleasure in being praised. Now, let me stop for a minute, okay? What he's bringing up is that um, the question is, how do you please God? Okay? How do you please God? You know, and I've th thought about this. Can you imagine going up to God and saying, oh, well, I did this and I did this and I did this. Look at all the things I did. Okay? What's interesting is the minute you try to tell God what you did to please Him, it brings no pleasure. Okay, right? But a child is able to please God because he hasn't done anything. Okay? Things were done to him. And he responded. Okay? So Lewis picked this up. This idea is simple that if you want to please God, you don't want to control your life. It's only the world that tells you to control and control and control. Okay? So let me keep going. Okay? The, the, there's a, um, apparently what I had mistaken for humility at all these years prevented me from understanding what is in fact the humblest, the most childlike, the most creaturely of pleasures, nay, the specific pleasure of the inferior. The pleasure of a beast before men, a child before its father, a pupil before its teacher, a creature before its creator. I'm not forgetting how horribly this most innocent desire is parodied in our human ambitions or how quickly in my own experience the lawful pleasure of praise from those whom it is my duty to please turns into the deadly poison of self-admiration. But I thought I could detect a moment, a very short moment, before this happened during which the satisfaction of having pleased those whom I rightly loved and rightly feared was pure. And that is enough to raise our thoughts to what may happen when the redeemed soul beyond all hope and nearly beyond belief learns at last that she has pleased him whom she was created to please. There will be no room for vanity. She will be free from the miserable illusion that it was her doing. Right? Okay. So the thought here is that most of the culture that you live around, and this could be your own life, okay? But most of the culture you live or that you're around spends its life doing things to get praise. But the very things it does to get praise doesn't bring it praise. Okay, right? And only the Christian has the answer. And the answer is, no, think most of the things that you want are because things are happening to you and you choose your response to those things. And those are what actually enable you to enjoy the praise of God. Okay? So this is something that medievals understood. It's mysterious and deep. You really have to think about it to, to understand. Because here's why. We're so immersed in modern thinking that we don't even realize that it's modern thinking. But when you, when you contrast it to another way of thinking, for a thousand years, this was Christian faith. Okay, let's keep going. Last one. Comfort and orderliness. Okay, the idea here... For a thousand years, this was Christian faith. Yep. Is um, the medievals believed the cosmos was like looking into a great <laughs> building, perhaps like the Chartres Cathedral? That's what this is right here. This is the Chartres Cathedral. I think it's Notre Dame, right? Is, uh, the Notre Dame the Cathedral, the overwhelming in its greatness, but satisfying in its harmony. The medieval model held all of creation to be bound in a complex unity that encompassed all of time and space. Distinction, definition, tabulation was his delight. Order was evident in all of creation. Everything had a value given to it by God. Every object and every action had its purpose. It was a world of godly ordered precision, not godless chaos. A storm represented the plans and purposes of God or the work of devils which God allowed for di divine reasons. Medieval conclusions didn't entertain nominalist explanations about their world. Whatever it was, a storm, a storm wasn't a meaningless act of water condensation. Okay? So basically, the, the universe is charged with order. Okay? Now this is, the idea here was that if you look at a, a model of the universe, the, the medievals had figured out every layer of the, of the universe. Now, it was ultimately wrong, okay? You know. But that's beside the point. The point was, what was their imagination about the universe? What we imagine today is, a, is an empty universe 
that, um, that basically is, is just lots and lots of space surrounded by random objects for which we don't know why they exist. Okay? But the medievals saw their universe like we see this cathedral right here. So when they looked out at the universe, like you just go out in the night sky, there was a deep sense of order that was being brought in them and they were part of it. Okay? And so in other words, they were walking in meaning, you know, every step they took. The, the cosmos was complete in the sense that the medieval mind could not conceive of improving their perfect and beautiful model of the cosmos. Lewis states, they, basically the art, you see this in medieval art, it looked, un, it looked un, um, unoriginal. They're not trying to heighten or transform it, it possesses them wholly. In other words, when they looked out, they saw the very best. <laughs> they couldn't think of anything better. It, Lewis felt medieval writers are so enamored with the completeness of their cosmic model, they didn't see anything to improve. As a result, their literature appeared unoriginal. The writer feels like everything would be so interesting in itself that there's no need for him to make it so. Medieval art included depictions of their cosmos, not for their own sake, but because the depictions made their art more interesting with their images carried one's mind back to the model as a whole. Rather than seeking out new and original themes, the medieval model of the cosmos led the culture to find satisfying meaning in what already exists. Okay? So the thought here is, is that the world around you is continually, you know why technology is such a big thing? You know, we're trying, now it's all into the, you know, the VR and all this stuff, right? We're trying to find something meaningful over and over and over again, instead of somebody just saying, hey, hang on, let me help you find meaning in everything around you. Okay. See, it's a continual search. It just goes on and on and on. But you as a Christian get to burst that bubble. Okay. This is sharing the gospel. Okay. Right. You know, sharing about Jesus is an entry into, into the gospel of reality, you could say, about, about what God has done and the, the life that he has for you. We call that discipleship. Right. So uh, let me keep going. The implication. We have a divinely ordered place in this world. We aren't just in a fight for survival. It's not, up to, up, it's not up to us to find a place in this world, and it's not up to us to create our own identity. Events aren't random and indiscriminate, right? In our current world, you're just a blob of tissue that needs to figure out if you're a boy or a girl, right? I mean, seriously, why? Because it's such a vacancy of meaning of what it means to be a, a girl or a man or a woman or anything else. Yes? I mean, seriously, why? Because it's such a vacancy of meaning. Of what it means to be a, a girl or a man or a woman or anything. Yeah. 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 Okay, so the thought here is, is, that, is that you and I can pursue more meaning, but we're not doing it out of a lack of meaning. Okay, so you and I can pursue meaning because he, he intended us to live forever with him and to find more and more and more of such, okay? But what, when, right now, you and I, you can go outside and look up at the universe and you should be saturated by meaning. But we live in a world where we don't even bother to look up, right? And if we do look up, all we see is a few little twinkling stars which represent physics and a bunch of empty space and it's almost like terror, terrorizing. Wow, I'm just, God, I'm all alone, you know, right? So the difference is that, is, that, is that you should be able to find full satisfaction in the world that surrounds you, and you can lead people into finding that satisfaction. That's not to say you're not looking for ever more meaning, which is found in God. Okay, does that help? Okay, let's keep going for it now. But um, our universe can produce a sense of completion and satisfaction and meaning in what exists. Instead of loneliness, emptiness, smallness, and a muted sense of terror and bewilderment, rather than continually searching for meaning, we can find meaning all around us. Okay, right? This is an example of some of the blessings that you and I have to offer that we don't even recognize. Okay? Now, translating this into you know, a conversation, I, I want to do that with you guys. Okay? You know, but we gotta, I got to give you eight weeks of, the, of all the stuff to prime the pump. Okay? You, there's so much we can do with this. Okay? But I just want to make sure you, you see that this is medieval thinking. Okay, let's keep going. Instead of staring into vast swaths of dark, empty nothingness, we gaze into a sea that fades into mist, recognizing our loneliness and feeling lost on a shoreless sea. This is most people, okay? Empty, alone. Now, you imagine a transgender person, okay? They're, let's just imagine a teenage girl, okay? 
maybe on a scale of one to 10, she feels, whether no matter how pretty she is or not, she feels like she's a six or a five. Her life is not that interesting and nobody seems to notice. And, um, and everything around her in all of her classes says she's a bunch of biology. Okay? There's no meaning anywhere. And her job is to take charge of her life and to make something of it, make meaning of it. You know? Now, when I understand the meaning of her life to her, I have a lot of compassion and empathy. I don't feel the need to go tell her she's a sinner, right? I feel the need to help her find redemption in Jesus. But I don't feel the need simply to say, you're wrong. I find the need to help her understand, wow, look at the world that you, you're growing up in, this emptied world that's forced you to think the way you're thinking, right? Now, that is a message that any person would receive. Okay. Why? Because it's, there's so much meaning in it for them. Right. But when you just say, Hey, you know what, what you're doing is wrong and God hates it. Okay. Well, that's a true statement. Okay. But there's no meaning in it. So what are they supposed to do? I know that I've got a world I'm trying to construct. All you're doing is trying to give me some, some shell of some ideas from, you know, from some prophetic voice somewhere trying to say something that I don't even know what you're talking about. Because what I'm thinking, at least I know what I'm thinking, right? Does that make sense? See, this is why cultural apologetics, I think, has such a place in today's world. Because we're not saying, or what cultural apologetics, you're not saying that sin and those things don't exist. You're trying to understand the definition of sin, like what it's doing to people, how it's marring their world and their ability to understand it. Okay? Now let's keep going, because that gets into evangelism. Okay? We don't have to spend our energies trying to create value out of our lives. Okay? Let's keep going. Just for the sake of time. What time is it? Okay. If it's okay, I'm going to go for 10 more minutes. I think most of the other classes are over. Okay. Two areas of cultural insight, right? Okay. Um, we talked about sacramentalism. Now we're going to talk about order from chaos. Okay. And I, this, don't worry, this isn't as long. Although I'd love to, you know, you, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a chatter. Order from chaos. Okay. This is interesting. For the medievals, d distinction, definition, tabulation was his delight. Order was evident in all of creation. Everything had a value given to it by God. Okay, right? Every object and every action had its purpose. It was a world of godly ordered precision, not godless chaos. Right? A storm represented the plans and purposes of God or the work of <laughs> devils, which God allowed for divine reasons. Okay, right? We talked about this. Um, medieval conclusions didn't entertain nominalist explanations about this world. By the way, the world doesn't want nominalist explanations. That's all they have. Okay? But they don't want it. Okay. Whatever it was, a storm wasn't a meaningless act of water condensation, and yet the same orderly world of medieval man was equally terrifying. Man was not in control. It was a world full of devils. Plagues would ravage entire villages or even countries. Pain was an unfortunate and often untreatable reality. Entire civilizations were in upheaval, and security and peace were mirages. Medieval man worked tirelessly to bring the same order and meaning to his world that he observed in creation. Okay? One of you brought this up, but it's not like we live in a world uh, that doesn't have real enemies. Right? You know, I mentioned about St. Patrick. I can't remember who it was. One of you sent me an article. But basically, you know, um, everything I've shared with you about St. Patrick, those are facts. But for every fact I could give you, there is a world that's, that is going to share with you distortions of those facts. You know, St. Patrick was a, you know, was a um, geno genocidal maniac or whatever else, right? And because you live in a real world full of real chaos also, okay? And the medievals were aware of this. I mean, they saw it more than most because, you know, the Black Plague and everything else was part of their world, okay? And the idea here is that is that they understood that there was a battle to fight. This was order from chaos. It wasn't just order upon order. Somehow this world, even though they could see the things that God was doing and, and, and they could enjoy the cathedral that was the universe that surrounded them, even though they could see all these things, they realized that the everyday practicality of life included chaos. Okay, So... Medieval evangelism was seen through the paradigm of bringing order to chaos. Okay, so we're going to talk real shortly about evangelism and medieval evangelism because I think this has a lot to say about today also. Okay? So the thought here, Anglo-Saxon Christians recognized that the tribal leader was ordered by God. Okay, in other words, there was orders in society itself. Okay, so if you look at, a, at Microsoft, Microsoft is a very ordered company. So is Apple. 
there's, there's a CEO and it just goes on and on, right? So you could think of this idea of tribal leader and they, they recognize the, it, was, it was ordered. C.S. Lewis states, we see how everything links up with everything else. At one, not in flat equality, but in a hierarchical ladder. Thus the leader represented the key to evangelizing the people in his care. The message of salvation would come to the king or ruler and then would be brought to the people of God uh, to the people that God had divinely ordered and directed under his influence. Okay, the idea here was that medieval evangelism wasn't random. Okay, they realized, hey, you know what? If this guy is a gatekeeper, then maybe God is more at work in this guy than this person who's not a gatekeeper, right? Now, we think modern, in modern terms of everything's equal, and I'm not trying to say that's wrong or anything, okay? We're just studying medieval evangelism, okay? But in a medieval understanding, you would realize, you know what? God is probably more at work in the king than he is in the average person in the sense of his influence or what he wants to do for us to reach this culture. Okay, does that make sense as far as their thinking? So in other words, they targeted people like kings or tribal leaders. And um, you could think of your local city and you could think of a teacher, right? Or you could think of a boss or a professor. Okay. These, in, in medieval understanding of chaos, they understood, hey, you know what? There's ordering to the world. There's a reason a professor is a professor. There's a reason that Sindar Pinchai is the leader of Google. There's a reason that Taylor Swift is allowed the influence that she's been allowed. There's a reason that you have the boss you have. You know, now that's not necessarily a, an unchristian idea. We already understand that. But the idea was that they took this to understanding of evangelism. Right? So there was a reason behind it. So the idea here is that medieval Christians recognized the chaos, threatened their order. It was a cosmic battle to bring <clears throat> lasting order. Okay? The idea was even if they, if they accomplished something, they didn't rest on their laurels. They knew that whatever they accomplished could, would undo itself very quickly. Now, you guys as FC, you guys understand this because you work with young people. Okay? The idea is that you could build something up and then chaos ensues and all of a sudden it's back down to some other level right? And the idea, that's a medieval understanding, okay? Now, if you have a medieval understanding, that doesn't shake you. You realize, man, it's, it's, it's chaos. We're fighting with chaos, and we're going to come back in another way. Yes, sir. That's a medieval understanding, okay? Now, if you have a medieval understanding, that doesn't shake you. You realize, man, it's chaos. We're fighting with chaos, and we're going to come back in another way. I know that over time, I'm going to forget stuff, and it's going to fall apart. And it's going to go into chaos. Yes. That's right. It's exactly right. And it happens, in, it happens in churches, it happens in cultures, it happens in individuals. That's right. And so the idea here is when you understand a medieval understanding of chaos, they actually planned for chaos. Okay, in other words, they knew, let's look at this, okay? So medieval Christians recognize the chaos that in their order, okay, yeah, okay. The tribal leader king could be defeated in battle, right? You know, like they could sit there and make, um, make all this progress in a culture because they won over a king. And by the way, the key to winning over the king was they believed in faith that God is at work in the king. So they would do things like challenge the king. They would challenge the king's heart. You know what? We believe that the, that the God of heaven who sent Jesus is at work in your life. And he'd be like, who is, this, who is this God of heaven? And what does he believe? And they'd say, well, we believe that he has this, this, this desire for your life and he's going to prove it to you. He'd be like, who is this God and King who's going to prove it to me? Well, he's going to, he's going to do this in your life until you, recognize his, until you recognize his kingdom, right? So sure enough, what would happen in the king's life? Things would happen in his life that would challenge his kingship, and he would realize, oh my God, the Christians were right, right? Why? Because there was a voice of Christians in the heart of the king reminding them what God was at work doing in his life. And as soon as, he was, as soon as he was reminded of what was happening in his life, when, when the king's life didn't work out, he would recognize, oh my God, I need to bow to the God of the Christians who told me this would be the way it is. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. So this was evangelism for, for, for medieval times. The idea was, and it doesn't have to be a king, right? It can be a professor. But the idea was that they were used to the idea of introducing God into their heart. Not with the view that he, was going to, that he was going to immediately accept it, but with the view that if we, if we bring God and what God is doing in that person's heart, then God, when God does that thing, that person is going to 
have to come to the one who put him in that place. Okay. Now, this, I think this is fascinating stuff when you think about evangelism. Okay. But so the heart of the king could change also, right? So they also knew chaos could ensue because they could win the heart of a king. And then maybe chaos ensued and the, the king decided he had a hardened heart. And they needed to handle kings could be defeated, chaos could ensue. Like you, you mentioned, Ryan, right? They, 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 things could change on the inside. They could forget. Right? So cultural circumstances could shift, plague, weather, disasters, right? There's all kinds of things. So this was the evangelistic battle that, the, that, the, that for a thousand years, this is how Christians thought of evangelism, a battle with chaos and the ability to win over people of influence by simply by challenging the person of influence with the things of God. When their heart was humbled, they could bring in the gospel and the person would bow down on his knees in the snow, right? You know, you'd have kings bowing in the snow and, you, and we, we sometimes wonder, wow, God was doing so much back then. I wish he'd do that today, right? Well, the truth is he's doing the same thing today. We just aren't asking the king challenging things anymore. Right? So that's, this is something we learned from medieval understanding of order and chaos. Okay? Um, so the insights we get on modern evangelism. Right? Um, we should place an emphasis on the role of leaders as gatekeepers. Okay? Um, we are, uh, who are the local gatekeepers? Right? School board officials, professors, teachers, lawyers, judges, bosses, managers, anyone with a function of overseeing somebody else. Right? Now, that doesn't mean that's the only like, at all, but this is medieval insight. Okay, let's keep going. How do you reach a gatekeeper? Demonstrate the power of God in the area of their power. Medieval focus was on assuming inherent instability. Right now, by the way, demonstrating the power of God in the area of their power, that's faith, right? you got to believe God. That, you see it all through history. People believe God. Now, there were even stories of, you know, people that were saying, you know, they, they, some king was worshiping a tree. So I think, I can't remember his name, starts with an O, but, you know, went over there and said, well, I challenge that tree. And he took an ax to it, you know, and, they, and the tree falls. And so all, everyone's like, wow, that's the power of God, right? Well, I don't know um, what, your, what your degree of faith is, or, you know, I mean, this is for all Christians. You know, some Christians have more faith than others, and it's indifferent different areas right you know but the point is is that is that is that challenging people to see the power of god in their area of power that's modern evangelism today patricius right that's what he did um and that's actually what we're talking about that you know that there's also today there's very real enemies to it okay um evangelism was the beginning not the end of a spiritual battle and we talked about that and um, so they did establish beachheads. And the idea was that if you're going to lose ground, you still got to have a beachhead. And the beachhead that I want to present to you is what Jesus said. You are a city set on a hill, right? So in other words, the, the, the local church was meant to be the beachhead, but it had to be a local church that could be a, a light that shines its light. Remember, what is, a, what is a city on a hill do, right? It shines its light upon the culture, right? All around it, the culture is being illuminated. And sometimes, I don't know, we just forget the most basic understanding of the city on a hill. But that's a picture of the church, right? And so the idea for the moderns was that we have to establish beachheads because of chaos. Comes and goes, comes and goes, comes and goes. Okay. So I'm going to finish with, um, oh, the first Christians gained converts not because their arguments are better than those of the pagans. That's what we've, we've settled in on a very intellectual version of faith, right? You know, I'm going to tell you why you should believe. Oh, I'm going to tell you why I don't believe. Well, I'm going to tell you why I believe. Okay, you know, this, that's what we've settled into as a, I think it's a cheap substitute for faith, to be honest, okay? But they gained converts not because their arguments are better than those of the pagans, but because people saw in them, in their communities, something good and beautiful and they wanted it. This led them to the truth, okay? Um, so the end of medievalism, I'll just finish with this. So what killed it, right? Because it did die. And it, it actually died by the hands of a Christian. I don't know if you knew it. His name was Occam, Occam's razor. <clears throat> he came up with this idea, which was actually wrong, okay? But he, he was trying, okay? His idea was, he was well-meaning, said, if the infinite God reveals himself through finite matter, does, not, does that not imply limitation of God? In other words, if God is, if, if, 
God, okay, let me just keep going. Occam thought so. He denied metaphysical realism out of zeal to protect God's sovereignty. He feared that realism restricted God's freedom of action. For Occam, if something is good, it is because God desired it to be so. The meaning of all things derives from God's sovereign will. That is, not because of what he is or because of his participation in their being, but because of what he commands. If he calls something good today and the same thing evil tomorrow, that is his right. The idea implies that objects have no intrinsic meaning, only the, only the meaning assigned to them, and therefore no meaningful existence outside the mind. A table is just wooden nails arranged in a certain way until we give it meaning by naming it a table. Nomen is the Latin word for name, nominalism. And so, so nominalism is the idea of naming things, right? In Occam's thought, God is an all-powerful entity who is totally separate from creation. God has to be, taught Occam, or else his freedom to act would be bound by the laws he made. A truly omnipotent God cannot be restrained by anything in his view. If something is good, therefore it is God because it is because God said so, right? So Occam came up with this, this literally shriveled medievalism. But you know the problem with this idea here? Okay, one, God did declare everything good, right? Two, God did intimately link himself with creation. That's what we have in the Son, right? Forever, God has intimately become one of us and linked himself with creation, right? So Occam really just missed the point, but this came along with some other things, okay? It also came um, with, um, okay, so the bubble was burst. Um, th they discovered that one didn't need to have a philosophical theory about natural phenomena as being in order to examine empirically and draw conclusions. Okay, you could say what happened is the old world with its metaphysical certainties, its hierarchies and its spiritual focus gradually ceased to hold the imagination of Western man. Art became less symbolic, less idealized, less focused on religious themes, more occupied with the life of man. Okay, you know what happened? After a thousand years, people just got a little bored with the idea. Okay, and now a new thing came in, a new sheriff came in, it was called reason, and it mixed with Occam's ideas. And all of this together also mixed with a hundred years war and the black death. And you know what came out of it was, we call it individualism, which was the, um, was the enlightenment. In other words, the, sh the focus shifted from the glory of God for a thousand years, it shifted back to the glory of man, to the glory of Rome, right? And we call that the enlightenment. Okay. So for a thousand years, you had this idea of medievalism and then it came to a crashing halt with Occam and the Black Death and a, and a Hundred Years War and all of it came together and it also came with, you know what, we're ready for something new. That was really it. We're just ready. In other words, the world was ready to embrace the Enlightenment. Now, that was not necessarily all negative, but it did usher in a whole new way of thinking, which we call modernism, which we're going to talk about for two weeks, not one. And it's even more, if you think this is insightful, I... I the modernism is even more insightful, okay? So I just want to say that to get you to come back, okay? Because we have spring break, okay? And as we get more and more into modern times, you get even more insight into what's going on, okay? So with that finished, I um, do want to say that... Um, oh, that's so what, what encapsulated the, the Renaissance, we can become what we will, right? See, that, that is the new mantra that became... The medievalism died and is now we can become what we will. If it sounds familiar, that's kind of, that feels a little more at home. This is, this is a little bit more of what we're familiar with. It's so contrasted with medievalism. Okay. So with that said, um, it wasn't, the Renaissance wasn't necessarily anti-Christian, but it was centered on man's potential. So we went basically swung from God's potential to man's potential. That's not all bad. God made man. Okay, so let's finish. And the idea here, I need to give you homework and I didn't get to that. So I'm going to give it to you. But I will, how about this, okay? Some of you didn't finish. I did want you to send me questions. Some of you did. Man, they're so good. They were so good, your questions. Please send me questions. That's your homework, okay? And if you haven't watched things, I am going to put together five again because it's got a bunch of echo. I remade one. Go ahead and just, you know, catch up with this stuff. This is your future, if you ask me, okay? This is your future, the future of the world. It's worth it. Send me your questions and tell me if you think it's a good idea if you're about the idea of doing some dialogue where we can just discuss things after we're done with the class, okay? So let's pray, I'll end the class. Lord, thank you. Thank you so much, Lord, that you've given us, Lord, uh, just uh, pictures of who you are, 
Lord, engage us. Help us to just um, get the good, not the bad, Lord. We don't want idolatry and idolism and all that stuff. Lord, but we do want to have insight into where we came from and where